In this chapter, we learn about caching. Caching is a fundamental concept of computer science. In fact, any system that you pick up, any large scale distributed system has some form of caching in multiple places and often in critical sections. So in this chapter, we will dive into what caching is, what are the benefits, what are the potential drawbacks and how we can mitigate those drawbacks using trade-offs. Let's take an example. You have a user on Instagram who's asking for their feed, their news feed. So the message reaches the server that please get me my news feed. The server queries the database says that for this user select star where user equal to so and so get me all the people that they're following and get me the posts of those people. The response comes back and is forwarded to the client. The overall time required for this is user to server, which in our case is 100 milliseconds server to database, which is 10 milliseconds database back to server. This is the response taking 10 milliseconds and the server finally sending back the response to the client, which is again, hundred milliseconds. So the total time here will be 220 milliseconds. If you had to optimize this system, what would you do? There would be two parts that you can look at. The first is client to server communication. And the second is server to database communication. When it comes to caching on the backend, we usually focus on the second part, which is server to database. In our case, you can see that it doesn't have as big an impact as client to server. So that is also important. We look at that maybe in some other chapter here, we are focusing on the backend engineering side. So there may be many, many services connecting to the database. If you can introduce some optimization here, you will cut down this 10 milliseconds to maybe one millisecond. Now, one optimization here is that similar users ask for similar feeds. So for example, a young software engineer who likes football, and is in India will get a newsfeed. A very similar newsfeed can be given to another young software engineer who likes football in India. So you can group users into a single cohort and give them similar newsfeeds. Now, when one user from this cohort asks for a newsfeed, you generate it from the database the first time, store it in local memory and give the response. The next time when a similar user comes, instead of querying the database, you just query your local memory right? Because you have this information stored instead of recomputing it, instead of recalling the database, you take your already stored result and give it back as a response. And so the whole idea behind caching is reducing repeatable work through storage. Instead of doing the same computation again and again, you store it in local memory, give it back as a response. And usually caches are much faster to query than a database because caches are closer to your system. Here, as an example, if you take the cache query time to be one millisecond and the response to be one millisecond, if all of the queries can be answered through cache, it will be almost 10% in terms of savings. And this idea can be extended even to the client, even to the mobile device that you have. When you fetch your newsfeed and you get a response, if the user is scrolling the newsfeed again and again, they come back, they keep their phone, they come back again. You can reuse the newsfeed that you've already fetched from the network. So instead of making a 200 millisecond call, store it in your local device in a mini cache inside the phone. And now you'll see that the response time of the app has gone down from almost 200 milliseconds to two milliseconds. Okay. This sounds like magic. Uh, and of course it is, there are drawbacks of caching and there are some limitations to caching that we'll talk about, but at a high level, caching reduces latency by just using more storage. So natural question here is why don't we take the entire database that we have and put it in memory, put it in cache for small systems. That makes a lot of sense. If you have some static data, which is in GBs, it makes sense to just take all of that data and put it in the cache if it's being queried often, but for large databases, fitting terabytes or petabytes of data into memory is just impossible, right? Uh, you may fit in a terabyte of data in memory, but it will be expensive. What happens here is you start to optimize on the things that you store in cache. You have to take a part of the database, a section of the database, which is most frequently used, put it in memory so that when a user is querying for some information, it's highly likely that the cache can serve it. There's a distribution of how many people go to the cache and how many people go to the database. So how many popular queries versus unpopular queries based on that, you have the final computation. Let's say 90% people go to the cache, 10% go to the database. You'll see that in the end, you will save less than 10% like two or four milliseconds. So now your job as an engineer is to look at what data is going to be queried. So you have to do some sort of prediction here and then store that in cache. 
so that when the clients actually call for the data, it's already in cache. And for that, we have to ask ourselves two important questions. One, when there's an update to the cache, how do we manage it? Because the cache is a copy of a database. Now, when there's an update, you will have to update the database and the cache together. Okay, so do you do it together? Do you do it later? There are many strategies here. We look at all the right policies. And the second part is what data do I evict? What data do I kick out of cache if there is an overflow? The reason for this is your cache memory is limited and your database is much, much larger. If a new video has become viral in your system where the video is in the database and all the users are querying for it, you want to move this video into cache, but your memory is full. So what do you do? You have to kick out something. You have to evict some video already existing in the cache to bring in this new video. This is a very common operation that the cache has to perform. And so you need a particular policy and algorithm which tells you what video should I kick out? Okay, what data do I evict? That's called a cache policy. The, these two questions form a cache policy. You might have heard of some of them, uh, least recently used, least frequently used. Uh, there's a lot of cache policies out there. Some of them are machine learning based also. As a software engineer, the most important ones to understand are least recently used and least frequently used. We'll talk about a few uh, in this chapter later. And as for right policies, we talk about all of them in the upcoming lessons. So we clearly know the benefits of a cache, you know, saved computation always sounds good. Low latency sounds good. Are there any drawbacks? Uh, I always find drawbacks interesting because when it comes to such a fundamental component, it's almost inevitable to have a drawback, but we kind of ignore it and we try to mitigate it, but it's good to know the drawbacks. What if your cache is not storing the data that is being queried by users in that case, all that will happen is that the request will come to the server. The server is going to check the cache. It's going to find that the data entry is missing. It's going to go to the database and get the entry. All that happened was this wasteful additional computation, which is going to the cache and coming back. So an unoptimized or a poor hit rate of a cache is actually going to hurt your system. One scenario where this may occur is if you have your clients querying your data in a sequence, Let's take one, two, three, four as a sequence. And let's say your cache memory is limited to just three elements. So the first request comes for one, the cache has the entry missing. It populates from the database, gives back a response. One is now in the cache. Then you have two, then you have three. And at four, you have something interesting. The cache is overloaded. You query the data four from DB. The DB gives you that entry and now you have to populate the cache. And what do you evict? Well, the least recently used, entry is one. So you evict one, you put in four, and now the client asks for one. You go back to the cache. You see that one doesn't exist. You populate one from the database. The entry, which is evicted is two. The client asks for two then, right? So the client is going in a sequence. And because of that, because of your caching policy, you're having something called thrashing where you're doing useless work. You're doing a lot of evictions and loading into cache, but none of that is helping your system. It's not reducing latency, it's increasing latency and it's wasteful memory usage. The second problem is a much more well-known problem. We'll try to mitigate it throughout the rest of the chapter, in fact. So uh, the problem is eventual consistency. If you have a copy of a data, then the copy has to be updated along with the original source of truth. So in our case, in most cases, the database is the source of truth. Right? The data that the database stores is the latest copy. Uh, the cache has a stale copy or a working copy that you can do with. Uh, I'll take an example here. Let's say you are seeing the number of likes on a YouTube video. For every added like, there's a query to the database, but maybe the cache is updated every hour or maybe every minute. Right? It doesn't need to have the latest number of likes in cache. That helps reduce the work on the cache side. But the drawback here is that the data is not true. Now, if you have financial transactions which are running caching systems, then you may see older entries, you may see stale entries, which could cause problems. Okay, so this is known as eventual consistency. Eventually, the cache will be consistent, but when? Well, that is determined by the policy that you use, as we'll see. Now, the last part about caching is where do you place the cache? Do you place it in your servers? So that will be an in-memory cache. This can be a map uh, which is running along with your application or you could place it in the database. So the database is getting queries 
commonly used queries are going to be cached by the database itself in its server. Or you can have a global cache. It's an external system. It itself is a cache server, which is being queried by API calls, get and put by the rest of the services that you have in your system. And this cache is independent. It can scale independently. It may be written in a different programming language. Uh, if you change the algorithm of the cache, there is no need to redeploy the code on your servers. So there are certain benefits. Uh, which one would you choose? Typically in a large scale production system, all three are applied. There's some in-memory data that you want to store. You want to basically cache data across the system. Even on your client device, you want to cache some data. Your database itself will have a small cache automatically as a black box. We don't know about it, but databases usually have a small cache for queries. But as a software engineer, what you are going to be concerned with most is having a distributed cache for a large scale distributed system. The reason for this, like we said, is the cache can scale independently. Its deployments are independent and multiple services can use the same cache, all of that logic, all of that algorithm without having to code it themselves. So concluding this introduction to caching, basically they save time, but the caching policy matters and the placement of the cache matters. Depending on your system, you need to make the right choices.